here I mentioned a young man by the name of Josiah who became king when he was how old? Does anyone remember? Eight years old. Now, this lesson that we're teaching today started off on one side, and as I started studying it as usual, the Holy Spirit started opening this big door of understanding of what we as Christians sometimes go through in our lives today. And I hope that something in this message will minister to you. Maybe it'll reveal something about yourself. Maybe it'll reveal something to you about someone that you're close to that you might be able to minister to them more effectively. Um, Josiah, being eight years old and becoming a king, he had lived with ungodly parents. Those parents were awful. They were worshiping idols. And he got to see this the whole time he was being raised. But when he got into the position that he did, he was moved by God to serve him and him alone. And Josiah held nothing back. He went and tore every single altar down. He, t he killed the priests that were worshiping those idols. He, let, I mean, he just took them all out. And he stood up before the people and he said, you know, I am going to serve God. He didn't use an excuse, well, my parents were ungodly or my parents taught me this. He stood as a godly person on his own. And something about his life that's really encouraging to me, he didn't come up with excuses. Well, I was abused or well, my parents were ungodly, or well, this happened to me back there. He didn't look in the past. He looked in the future. And as he's looking in the future, you know, he's, he's king, and he's starting to serve the Lord, and he's worshiping him in, in whatever way he knows. One of the, um, uh, the temple servants, they found scrolls inside of the temple, and they brought them to Josiah, and they said, look what we found. And he said, well, read them to me. And so they began reading these scrolls, which were of the Word of God, the old, you know, the Pentateuch. And they began to read them and say, well, wait a minute. He started renting, ripping his clothes, saying, oh, my goodness, who am I? I mean, here all this time he thought he was serving God with everything he had. And as he began to read the Word of God, he's like, wait a minute. I'm such, I'm, I'm just nothing. I'm nothing, even in all my service, even in, in everything I do. So he called the elders together, all the leadership in the land, and, in the, and the people as well. And he himself read the words to the people. And then he stood up and said, this day, from this day forward, this land is going to be known as a land who serves the Lord. I am serving the Lord. Is anyone else going to come with me or not? And the leaders started standing up. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. The people start standing up. He changed his, an entire nation by his choice. Do you know you're called as a king and a priest of the Lord? One choice to serve God and you can change an entire nation. But we're not going to do it sitting back and doing nothing. We need to stay in the word. We need to let it refresh us. Let the word change us. Washing of the water of the word. Let the Holy Spirit get in there and show us, but it's the word of God that washes us, that brings that refreshing that Rachel was talking about. When we hear the voice of the Lord, as we're in the word of the Lord. Now, Josiah lived his life and... There was a, um, a prophet who came to him and actually told him that because of the sins of his forefathers, because of the idolatry in his nation, that there was going to come a time when the northern areas were going to come in and take over Judah and Jerusalem and take them into captivity. But God said, I will not allow it to happen while you're alive. It'll happen after you. So, Josiah passes away, and his son takes over. Guess what his son did? Worshipped idols. Really? He was raised in a home where he was taught not to do these things. What about Josiah's other son? What did he do? The same thing. 
there's something that Floyd's best man, who was a woman, by the way, which is kind of funny, but yeah, she, um, Lynn, she told Floyd before Floyd and I got married, she said, think about this. You didn't choose your family before you, like you choose your friends. You didn't choose the family before you. And you're not going to choose what comes after you either. But the one thing you can choose is the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Make a good one. Stick with it. Do what you, you know, to, to live your life. You chose this person. Make it happen. And that's the way it should be in our relationship with God. Don't be hot. Don't be cold. But choose this day who you're going to serve. And like Charles was saying, hey, don't be ashamed to raise your hand and say, you know, I serve the Lord. He is my Savior. He is my everything. Without him, I am nothing. Nothing. I was the quiet girl in school. I didn't say a whole lot. I was the one who wanted to kind of shy away from everyone. Can you believe that? (sighs) I did. I was very quiet in school. And um, I did like to read my Bible. I liked to, to, they call me the preacher girl after a while because at some point I started opening up a little bit. And I was protected by, by God in the situations that we were in. I mean, I hung out with some pretty rough people for a long time, but God always allowed me to be protected in those situations. As Christians, we are called to teach others about the Lord. We are called as ministers. How many ministers do we have in the, in the house today? Every hand should be up if you're a Christian. We are ministers to who first? God. And as you are ministering to him, you are automatically ministering to people. It's not the other way around. I'm not ministering to you. I'm ministering to him by standing up here. And God can use me to flow out and minister to his people. The same way when you're walking through the grocery store or wherever. And what we're going to talk about today is God's true leader or God's true minister, God's shepherds. And even though you may not be called to be a pastor or called to be a teacher in the five-fold ministry, God has allowed us to be here on this planet to make a difference on this planet. What did he tell Peter? Do you love me? Go feed my sheep. Do you love him? Feed his sheep. When you're not here, I miss you. I feel, I mean, how many of you in here can say that? When someone of the family of God that you're, you know, interact with, when they're not here, you miss them. When Tim's not here, I'm looking around. Okay, well, who's here? Oh, Tim's not sitting in his seat. You know, whoever it is, I'm not just picking on you. I know you, so I can pick on you a little bit. But whoever's not here, I, you feel that something's missing because we are a part of the body of Christ. Amen? There's many, many shepherds in Scripture. Abel, Adam and Eve's son, Abel, was a keeper of the flocks. We're talking back in Genesis. All through history, there's all these shepherds. Jesus Christ himself is looked at as a shepherd. There's three different terms that's used to describe Jesus himself. He's the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. In John 10, verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know and recognize me. That fire that you might feel like you're missing on the inside of you, that first love, that moment when you first got saved, you're, you're trying to get back to that moment. Well, what does it say? As you seek me, you know, we're the ones who, who go after the Lord. And as we draw closer to him, he'll do what? He'll draw closer to us. And that fire can be rekindled. But the more we close ourselves off and the more we block the good shepherd from tending to us, the more we're going to feel alone, abandoned, suppressed. But the moment we open up to God, he comes in and he can tend to his flock. But the scripture says, if you sin, what do you do? First John, 
Good job. See, they're listening, Pastor. Confess it. He is faithful and just to forgive you. Don't let sin separate us from the Lord. Amen? He's made a way where we can just go straight to him. In Proverbs 27, verse 23, it says, and I'll get a second here. This is in the Amplified. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to your herds. All right. Charles is a father. He's got three kids in the house and a wife. And as a father, as a husband, he's diligent to know the state of his flock. He knows what's going on with them. He knows where they are spiritually. He knows, he knows where he is spiritually. He knows where he stands. And he looks well to his herds. A person who has given their life over to the Lord, they've, they've reached that, yes, I'm saved, they're on fire for God. It's more than just that. It's more than stopping at that mode. It's about a relationship with God. It's not about the religiosity of the do's and the don'ts and wear your suit when you come to church or be, act, and do whatever somebody else tells you. It's about God and our spiritual relationship with him. Can I get an amen in here? Does this make sense to y'all? So every person in here, you, believe it or not, have been given responsibilities of other people, whether it's in your home, on your job, whether it's in here, we're responsible to one another. We are responsible to know the state of our brothers and sisters as well. We are responsible because if someone comes in who's in pain and they need prayer, who's going to pray for them? Whoever here, oh, you got pain? Right now, let's pray. You dealing with something? You know, Miss Susan's really good for that. I mean, you go to her and say, you know, this is what, well, let's pray right now. I don't care where you are. She's going to stop it all and pray. How many of you in here have done that in the grocery store? Just stop everything and pray for someone. Amen. Hallelujah. It's very important. No, 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 those that are around you and what's going on. Now, in the New Testament, we had certain people who were supposed to be taking care of of God's people. You have the Sadducees who were more of the political group, which everything had to be done a certain way. Then you had the Pharisees who were actually people who were middle class businessmen. They were in contact with the common man. They kind of had an understanding. But they were held in much higher esteem by the men, common men, than the Sadducees were. They were a minority in the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the ruling council during that day who made decisions for that area. They held a minority number of positions as priests, and they seemed to control the decision-making of the Sanhedrin far more than the Sadducees did, even though there were more of them there, because they had the support of the people. Religiously, they accepted the written word as if it was inspired by God. At the time of Christ's earthly ministry, this would have been what is now our Old Testament. But they also gave equal authority to oral tradition. And they attempted to defend this position by saying it went all the way back to Moses. And I'll explain that in a minute. Evolving over centuries, these traditions added to God's word, which is forbidden in, like, Deuteronomy 4.2. You don't add or take away from the word. The Pharisees sought to strictly obey these traditions along with the Old Testament, and the gospel abounds with examples of the Pharisees taking these traditions and trying to make them equal to God's word. Now, let's just go back in Jesus' time. Let's look at a couple of the things that Jesus brought out to the Pharisees. He pointed out to them in Matthew 9, verse 14. You know, the Pharisees are walking around, and they have this little judging thing going on with Jesus. They're trying to weigh him out to see how he's going to respond to these things. Let's read this here. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus inquiring, 
why is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, that is, abstain from food and drink as a religious exercise, but your disciples do not fast? So here, this disciple of John, who is asking on behalf of he and the Pharisees, they're all wondering, why aren't you fasting? This is something we do. Questioning, why aren't you doing it this way? There's another thing that they question him about. In Matthew 15, we're going to look at verse 1 and 2. And when you read in Scripture and you read where they say the scribes and the elders and the priests, they're talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're not just talking about one group. They're talking about them as a whole because they were constantly coming to Jesus. It says, Then from Jerusalem came scribes and Pharisees and said, Why do your disciples transgress and violate the rules handed down by the elders of the past, for they do not practice ceremonially washing their hands before they eat. Now, let me just give you a little tidbit here. How would you feel if you went to someone's house and you're wanting to have dinner with them and they walk up to you and say, you know, you haven't cleaned your fingernails. Can you please go in the restroom and wash your hands before you come back out here? What's that going to make you feel like? Well, I wash my hands. I'm a worker. I, I, I've done the best I can. See, guilt is a form of control. You're not doing it the way I think you should do it. Guilt putting guilt on people to make them feel like they're not doing what they should be doing is a form of control. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to control Jesus, and they couldn't. And so they started asking him questions in front of the people, trying to lure him into making a mistake, of which he did not. But they were using their own man-made laws to try to hook him in. You didn't wash your hands before you ate. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? If I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. <laughs> I mean, you're all laughing. You're all probably hungry in here. That's why you're laughing. But I'm going to eat. If there's no water to wash my hands, I'm still going to eat. Okay? But think about this. As the years have gone on from Christianity, even back in Jesus' time, think about the early 19th century where starting a new world. People are trying to leave the English ways of doing things and that, you know, hierarchical system that was set up. And they came to America for freedom of what? Religion. They wanted to worship God the way they wanted to worship God, in freedom. But as the time went on, the next thing you know, we have this liturgical church and that liturgical church and another church and these all these different views on how to read the word and, and decide what it says, and we're going to go this way or go this way. But what has happened is we've got these little oral traditions that we've allowed to creep into the church. And when we take those oral traditions, and I'll give you a couple of examples. I mentioned one, dressing up to go to church. Does Aunt Carol look good? She all, girl, when she walks in, she'll tell you, Michelle's always looking at my shoes because her shoes always match her outfit, and she's just beautiful. Is there anything wrong with her dressing up and coming into church? No. Is there anything wrong with me wearing flip-flops if I want to come in and flip-flop? Whoa, I didn't hear that one as loud. Yeah. Does it matter? Come as you are. And in this church, we have always felt, hey, we brought someone in and sat him right here. How many of y'all remember that day? Yeah. And it didn't matter what they had on. It's about the person. It's not about the oral traditions. Well, you didn't quite, whoa, you didn't bring your Bible, you know, or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. That's guilt. That's trying to put guilt on people. And what did Jesus come to do? To set the captive free. Free from guilt, free from shame, free from any kind of feeling of remorse for their sin, as if you never sinned. But the law will point out what you're doing wrong. How many of you in here have ever gone through your life 
looking at a situation and pointing out things that are wrong. You should do it this way, that way. The, it can get overwhelming, you know, and children, you know, as parents, we're trying to manage. And, I, you know, Jonathan came to me one day and he said, Mom, have I done anything right today? Jonathan, I just lost it. I started crying. I'm like, I'm so sorry because that particular day was not a good day for me. And I was unknowingly pointing out everything. Well, you didn't put your dishes in the sink, honey. You got to pick up. Mom, did I do anything right? He's so precious. But we need to get to the point where we are, what is love? Hardly notices when others do it wrong. Love hardly notices. Love doesn't care what you look like. Love doesn't care what you smell like. Love doesn't care. Love is pure. It doesn't look at the outward appearance. It sacrifices no matter what. No greater love is then when a person lays down their life for a friend, how much more they lay it down for their enemy. Who put Jesus on the cross? It wasn't all the sinners who were believing in him. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious people who could not figure him out, who were trying to conform him into their oral traditions of man. And we as Christians have to be so careful that we're not always pointing out negative, negative, negative. I'll be the first one to say I'm, I'm a pretty organized person when it comes to things and having that gift of organization and I always wanted to be a detective so I always want to walk in I can see things that are going on on the outside that no one else sees. And, well, I'm not saying that nobody else, but I've always had that ability to be able to see beyond just right here in front of me. And honestly, when you're trying to look for things that are misplaced and you're trying to organize, you've got to fight against that sometimes, trying to point out those negative things in others. And then you have your child walk up to you and say, Mom, uh, how many of you in here have ever struggled with that? Be real. Come on. I'm not talking about, you know, just myself up here. I know some others have too. So we have to... Be very aware of how we are interacting with each other because we are to help tend one another as well. Are we other shepherds? Not necessarily, but we are to help each other, to teach each other, even by what we go through. Amen? Now, Jesus was pretty specific about the Pharisees. He said in Matthew 23, we're going to look at verse 3. And actually, I'm going to read this. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, we're just going to read 23 verse 3 for right now. And Jesus is telling them, referring to the Pharisees, so observe and practice all that they're teaching you, because they were teaching the word of God. But do not do what they do. For they preach, but they don't practice it. So even Jesus was telling them, yes, they're preaching the word. Yes, they're sharing the word with you. But don't do what they do. How many of you in here know? All right, now I know. How many of you in here know that our leadership, we're not perfect? Everybody knows that the leadership is raising their hand first. We're not perfect, but if we as people look at the leadership like they're perfect and they make a mistake, then what happens? Oh, either we go the road of, well, if they can't get it right, I'm never going to get it right. Or, well, who do they think they are? Yeah. You're either going to get bitter or better. You've got to choose which one you're going to go with. Amen? Now, of course, 
we're all going to make mistakes, but are we out there habitually sinning, doing things we should not be doing that's absolutely cut and dry? No. We want to serve God. Our hearts are to serve God. They're not to serve another. And you will know a tree by their fruits. By their fruits. So in Matthew 23, and I thought this was kind of interesting. You have Matthew 23 in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. And he goes on, um, let's go ahead to to verse 4, if you don't mind, in Matthew 23. They tie up heavy loads. Heavy loads, loads that are hard to bear, is what Jesus was saying. Heavy loads. And place them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not lift a finger to help bear them. That's part of that guilt to control. They put that heavy burden, you're not doing it this way. You haven't stepped in this way. And so they try to push that on the people. So their character, they want to be seen by men. The Bible talks about how they dress up in their wonderful garb and Oh, call me rabbi. You know, this is who I am. Speak to me that way. Don't talk to me. I mean, I I can't tell how many people, yes, we respect Pastor Bob and Susan. We call them Pastor Bob and Miss Susan. And there's times I've seen us just in friendship and no harm done. Hey, Bob, what's up? You know, let's talk without calling. He doesn't get hung up on title. My name is Miss Michelle. It's not Michelle. If I told that to my youth, do you know how many of them kids would show up on Wednesday night? Half of them call me Mickey. Half of them call me Michelle. Half of them call me Miss Michelle. I mean, call my name. I don't care. I'm going to respond to you. Amen? All right. That's in Matthew 23. Think about this. Matthew 23. Now let's go to Jeremiah 23. Matthew 23 is the Pharisees who should be pastoring and shepherding the flock. Well, Jeremiah 23 is talking about shepherds as well. Let's listen to this. Jeremiah 23, verse 1. And we're going to go from verse 1 to verse 6. Woe to the shepherds or the civil leaders who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastoring, says the Lord. And go on to verse 2. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for and feed my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away and have not visited and attended to them. Behold, I will visit and attend to you the evil of your doing, says the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries to which I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds and pastures, and they will be fruitful and multiply. And I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they will fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither will any be missing or lost, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch or sprout, And he will reign as king and do wisely and will execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And that is his name by which he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah was stating to the leadership of that time, woe to you. He prophesied to Josiah's sons. He was talking to them about a time that was coming when they were going to be taken captive into Babylon. He was warning them, but he was also giving that hope of a Savior, the Lord our righteousness, for those who would truly follow after God's own heart. You have Jesus in Matthew 23 talking to the Pharisees, the religious of the day. You have Jeremiah talking to the religious people of that day who were in Jerusalem at the time, but they, also, they were serving idols. Now, 
What I find very interesting is there's another 23rd verse in the Bible that talks about shepherding. Who knows it? Hello? Psalms 23. Isn't that interesting? When the people got together to put, because you know the chapters and verses were not laid out in Scripture originally. There were letters written to people, you know, to the churches and the prophetic words, and they had to pray over them and decide which ones to actually put into the Word of God. And I am convinced, without a shadow of a doubt, that the way it was laid out was done very anointed and moved by God himself. There's a reason that 23 has such an f- emphasis on this. And I'm sure Frank can tell us what the number 23 means. I've looked it up, and there were several different variations of it. But one of the reasons why I believe this word is because I have put it into practice. I have studied it and put it into practice. And can I tell you, it works. I've laid hands on people, and they have been healed. I have cast out demons. I have stepped on poisonous things that have not bitten me. Thank you, God. I mean, we are protected. Amen? Now, one of the studies I did happen to be back in um, a while back, it's like a sidebar here, in Exodus where it talks about the candlestick. And the way they made the candlestick was a solid piece of gold. And on that candlestick was engraved these buds, like flowers that were not open. And they also had flowers that are open. And it kind of went like bud, flower, bud, flower, bud, flower, bud, flower, bud, flower, all the way up these pedestals of this candlestick. And when you study that in scripture and you read how many buds there are and how many flowers there are, there are 39 buds and there are 27 flowers. How many books are in the Old Testament? 39. New Testament. 27. The old foreshadows the new. The candlestick, the light of the word. It's beautiful. When you sit down and you start reading the word and you see how all these things start tying in, you can't help but to know that you know that you know it is God's word. If you're, like, like Charles was saying, if you're feeling suppressed, let the water wash you. Let it. Don't hide from God. Oh, I'm tired. I'm tired too, folks. You know, the number of gifts I have, I'm functioning, but I read my Bible. If all you have is a devotional, Put it in your restroom. When you go to the restroom, read your devotional. You do have to go in there at least once a day. So read your devotional. Whatever you have to do to get yourself filled, start somewhere. Start somewhere. Praise God for Rick. He shared, um, uh, you know, last week, too, about how, you know, we hear the word on TV and we hear, you know, hear it, um, you know, our spouses, we talk about it, but to get in it for yourself. And let it do its work. It's amazing. No matter what you're going through, God can use his word to fill you. And you will not know how to contain yourself. Trust me. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to go through this. Um, I know we have about 20 minutes or so. And this is what I saw as I was reading Jeremiah chapter, chapters 1 and 2. And I'm going to kind of read through this beginning to end fairly quick. Um, If you guys want to go through it, you know, on the screen, that's great. Chapter 1, Jeremiah. Those words are bigger, but that's okay. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priest, who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, two or three miles north of Jerusalem. That's where he lived, by the way. Two or three miles north of Jerusalem. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. 
It also came, or it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah. We talked about him. Until the carrying away of Jerusalem into captivity in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, and this is the Lord speaking to him, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and I approved you as my chosen instrument. And before you were born, I separated you and set you apart and consecrated you and appointed you as prophet to the nations. People, we as the body of Christ are called as kings and priests. We are the people that God is speaking to, I believe, prophetically through this message. As he's speaking to Jeremiah, let these words sink into you. He knew you and created you in your mother's womb. He knew you way in advance, far beyond. Then Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am only a youth. Only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Say not, I am only a youth, for you shall go to all whom I am going to send you to, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them and their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. The first time I stood up to speak in front of a group of people, I think I said, you know, you know, about a million times, because I was looking at their faces, you know, and every other word out of my mouth was that, and you know, they loved me through that. And they talked about it later with me, you know, because we were being critiqued on how we, we taught, and they're like, look, don't worry about their faces. When you go to minister to someone and you're saying, hey, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? They might jerk their hand back out of your hand. You don't know how they're going to respond. They may smack you. You don't know. But don't be afraid. Nine chances out of ten, if you do it in public, they're going to smile and nod. They're not going to do anything. Verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day appointed you to the oversight of the nations and of the kingdoms to root out and pull down and to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, when God touches our lives, he, he wants to implant or impart the word into our spirit to make us strong. He did that with Jeremiah. In his, as he was speaking to him, he put his words into his mouth. The Bible is very specific about when you're going out and you're ministering or you're doing something, don't worry about what you're going to say because God will give you the words to say. God himself will. And that's what he was telling Jeremiah. I will give you the words to speak. So body of Christ, church, don't worry about it. God will give you the words to speak. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch or a shoot of an almond tree, the emblem of alertness and activity blossoming in late winter. Then said the Lord to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. He's not only going to give you the words to say, he's going to make it happen. What? How easy is that? What does that Pastor Bob say? It's simple, not complicated. Praise God. And the word of the Lord came to me in the second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot. And the face of it is tipped away from the north with its mouth about to pour forth on the south, on Judea. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north, the evil which the prophets had foretold as a result of the national sin shall disclose itself and break forth upon the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I will call all the tribes of the nations of the north, says the Lord, and they will come and set every one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls round about and against all the cities of Judah, Judah as God's judicial act. 
a consequence of Judah's wickedness. We're going to stop right there on that verse. We're going to actually go into chapter 2. Because of the sin of Josiah's son, this happened. Jeremiah is speaking to the leadership of Israel when he's speaking these words out to them. He was warning them. God's speaking to him in this, and later on in Jeremiah, he speaks it out. Sorry, I need to make that clear. These words were a warning to the religious folks, the ones who were serving idols, worshiping themselves rather than God, getting consumed with other things other than God. The calamity was going to come upon them. And as a body of Christ, we have a responsibility to share with people what's going to happen if they don't turn their hearts 100% towards God. It's no longer walking on this fence, straddling half in the cold and half in the hot. If you're lukewarm, he's going to spit us out. I mean, that's pretty clear, folks. It's very clear. But God's love came in the form of Jesus I mean, think about that. Just for a second, everybody take a deep breath and think about that. Nothing you've ever done in your past will be held against you. He remembers it no more. It's gone. It's gone. It's done. It's over. And it doesn't matter what man, woman, or child comes in your face and start saying, but you did this. I remember, because you hurt me. No matter who does that to you, if you have confessed your sin and you have given it to God, it is finished. There's nothing anyone else can hold in judgment against you, because if they do, they're holding judgment over their own heads because they become religious. They've become religious to point out rights and wrongs in others' lives, and they're still whitewashed tombs. They have the appearance of godliness, but they forget where they've come from. They are men and women, too. Flesh is flesh. It doesn't matter whose bones it's on. We are born into this world as sinners, and we all need Jesus Christ. And now we can hold our heads up high. We are what? Saints. We are saints. The Bible calls us saints. There's not just a few of them to worship. As they, you know, in Catholicism, I mean, I went through Catholic classes. I'm very familiar with the traditions that they have set up. It's not about just the saints that they have. We as Christians are saints in the Lord. Amen? Say, I'm a saint. Nothing I've ever done will ever be held against me. Do I hear an amen? Now, let's look in uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to close with these last couple of verses here. Verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I earnestly remember the kindness and devotion of your youth. Like when when they first got the understanding of who God was. Your love after your betrothal in Egypt and your marriage at Sinai when you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holiness, something set apart from the ordinary purposes dedicated to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest, of which no stranger was allowed to partake. All who ate of it, injuring Israel, offended and became guilty. Evil came upon them, says the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What unrighteousness did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me, habitually went after emptiness, falseness, futility, and themselves became fruitless and worthless? Nor did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death and deep darkness, through a land that no man passes through and where no man dwells. 
last verse, verse 7. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination detestable and loathsome. When the Israelites were in the wilderness and they were being led through the wilderness by the cloud in the day and the fire at night. I don't know about you, but if I got in a helicopter with you and I told you I'm going to take you to this absolutely amazing place, you are not going to believe how big the grapes are. And I say, let's go. And I put you in this helicopter and we land in the middle of the desert. And I said, get out. Well, where, where am I going to go? Where, where are these big grapes? Well, I promised you we are going to get there. Well, this doesn't look like what I thought it was going to be. Well, you'll get there. God's going to lead you. And I get in my helicopter and I fly away and you're left in the middle of the desert. God promised them he was going to take them into a land of plenty. And when they got in that desert, a lot of people started murmuring and complaining, what, you took us out of Egypt to bring us here? This isn't what was told to me. You brought me here? And even in their murmuring and complaining, he still provided. Their shoes didn't even wear out, folks. The Bible says that. Carol, (laughs) their shoes didn't wear out. They had all the food they wanted, manna and quail, but they had to follow what God's plan was. Don't be bagging up the quail trying to eat it on the day that you're not supposed to. Don't do it to the bread or you just have nothing but maggots. You know, there's certain things that, yes, we have to follow in the word of God, but it's the word of God that we're following. Let's not get so consumed with the laws of men that we try getting into the laws of what everybody else wants us to do to the point we're pulled away from our first love. There's a book called God's Generals, and it has got many, many, many different forerunners and leaders, Smith Wigglesworth, many different people who were, I mean, just the Azusa Street Revival, I mean, all these leaders. And the one thing that kept happening over and over again in all of their lives is that other people tried to control what they were doing. And as soon as, oh, well, we'll take you into our house and we'll take care of you so you can minister to the Lord. And the next thing you know, and this is one scenario, the next thing you know, they're relying more on the people they're living with and the anointing of God starts fading and they're not moving in the calling of the Lord as they had originally called, was called. We have to be led by God My sheep know my voice, and the voice of another they will not follow. Do you know his voice? Are you close enough to him where when he speaks you don't question? Was that God? When we're young in the Lord and we're learning his voice and we're trying to understand, you know, Sure, it's okay to question, you know, was that me? Was that Satan? Was that God? But after a period of time in our relationship with him, we should be able to say, yep, God said, I'm going. Enough done. But as children, you know, babies, they don't really, they they know their mother's voice pretty much when they're born. But as they get older, they learn their father's voice. They learn other people's voices. The same with us as Christians. And this word, I was telling Floyd, I said, I don't know what to call this, but it was such an overview of pastoring and leadership and about not to get in the mode of trying to control your situation or the people that are around you, but be free because Christ has made you free indeed. It's okay to make a mistake, but get yourself up and keep on walking. Keep moving towards the goal. What is our goal? Christ. Any situation we have in our life. Oh, my focus needs to be on Christ. I'm looking over here. Oh, my goodness, this is worrying me. Christ. 
the cross, what he did for us. He has set you free from the law of sin and death. Sin and death. Do it wrong, you're going to die. Da, 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 da. He set us free from all that. Does that mean that we're going to rejoice in our freedom and do whatever we want? No. But we're going to allow him to be the shepherd of our lives. Allow him to have first place. Allow him to help build inside of us to do that work inside of us that needs to be done so that we can be used by him in a powerful way. There was this era where we went through a lot, and, and I guess it was back in the, the uh, late 80s, beginning of the 90s. Oh, God, use me. What fivefold calling am I called to? You know, hear so many people asking, well, what fivefold calling are you in? God, use me. But the whole time we were crying out for God to use us, he was trying to do a work inside of us so he could work through us. But when we got saved, we kind of stopped in salvation. I'm speaking of the body as a whole. We kind of got all excited in our salvation, but we forgot the second step of God actually working in us. He doesn't devastate the land. He's not going to come in and start pointing out every single thing you've done wrong. He's going to say, like in the situation with Jonathan, he used my son to point something out. Oh, wow. God, let me pray. Lord, help me to see the positive and not always the things that have to be done. Help me, Lord. And as I started yielding to him, I would go to open my mouth about something, and I would feel that check in my spirit. Don't say it. How hard is it for me to pick up the cup and just put it in the sink? Or should I bring up every single thing my kids aren't doing and break their spirit? Y'all hear what I'm saying? Being a peacemaker is very important. And there's a difference in being a peacemaker and being passive or religious. Let's be peacemakers. I want to encourage everybody in here. I hope this wasn't a heavy message for everyone to try to figure out, you know. But this is an encouraging message to me because you've been set free from all that heaviness. We don't have to be like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. <laughs> All perfect on the outside. Amen? You guys are beautiful. I'm glad you're my brothers and sisters in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen.